computer's turned in. Good afternoon. Finally, I figured out Nathan's got things under control. The, the mic wasn't on until he gave the high sign. Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. So glad you, you've uh, come out. Uh, it may continue to grow the crowd a little bit. This is a little, little bit sparse, but all the important people are here. I, I figured that out. All the important people are here. Uh, so good, good to see you all. And I so appreciate your support in this way and every other way that y'all show us out here. Um, come right in. Um, well, you've seen you've seen the topic for today: uh, uh, screening and prevention in uh, in for older adults. I think that's something we all should be very interested in. Um, do you know, um, many of you have been in the clinic or other clinics for annual wellness uh, visits that Medicare started paying for a few years ago. Um, first time I heard about it, it sounded like just a little bit of bureaucratic extra stuff and Medicare is capable of that, we know this. But, um, you know, I, I do think it's a, it's a positive thing uh, that they've, it's a way to ensure that uh, in every older adult patient population, every clinic practice, uh, there is a, a way to ensure that there's protected time just to go over the really important aspects of prevention and screening and that kind of thing and be sure we're, we're being thorough because now the guidelines as they're going, as these young doctors are going to share with you, the, the guidelines are so well uh, worked out in terms of what's recommended to be done for screening and for prevention that we all ought to be on the same page and we ought to be very intentional with every person who, who's a patient um, that they've at least heard what's recommended. And the final analysis is your choice whether you do any of them, of course, but uh, it's the product uh, of the best thinking and the consensus among the experts in most in most cases. So um, I think when they're, and you know the history of Medicare. Many of you will know this better than me, but Medicare historically never paid for anything that was prevention. It was a diagnosis of sickness that you know, an episode of sickness that got paid for. And without that, nothing got paid for. So the first exception, as I recall, was pap smears. 
you know, 20 to 30 years ago. And then later, but by the hardest, colonoscopies um, became, you know, something that's reimbursed periodically in specific ways. Uh, mammograms and and a number of other things now, bone densities. So, so that that's progress really because those things, uh, you know, you're listen. You, I, I want to count myself as part of it too. But you're a generation that understands, uh, you know, things like uh, being uh, 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 a penny wise and a pound foolish and things like that. I mean, the wisdom that goes into prevention and how much and especially for a payer like Medicare, uh, you're going to pay a lot less preventing something than you will treating it and curing it and living through it. So so I hope this will be helpful, and, uh, and I hope it generates some conversation because we want you not just hear a, a talk. I'm sure it will be excellent, but we want to feel like you go away with the information you need as well. So as usual, I'm accompanied by much brighter and much younger doctors. Let me, and a soon to be doctor. I'll first introduce Maya Merriweather, who's with us this month. Maya is a fourth year medical student. So she'll, she'll get her MD degree next spring. And she's probably not going to, she, I hope she works in this area, but, but she, Probably isn't going to be of a lot of service out here. She's going to be delivering babies in her future career. We don't have many of those out here. But uh, you can still come back. And, you, and, and your gynecology practice, of course, would be. So it's been great having Maya here. Our, our two doctors um, this, this time and giving the, the, the talk today are uh, Dr. Ashlyn Abbott, um, we'll start off, and, and Ashlyn is uh, a first-year resident, so she just started back in July. She's, uh, everyone's already pegged her as a star, though we're, we're so proud of Ashlyn. Ashlyn grew up in Arkansas, but not this part of Arkansas, kind of like me from another corner of the state. She, uh, she grew up in Walnut Ridge. Any of you familiar with Walnut Ridge? Beautiful little town. Uh, over in the northeast corner of, of the state. And uh, came to the university, came to Fayetteville for undergrad, and she's just gotten her, her medical degree um, from ARCOM in Fort, in Fort Smith, the new Arkansas College of uh, Osteopathic Medicine. Um, first class? First class. Top of her first class, somewhere up there in the top. I, we haven't discussed that part. Um, and so we're so glad to have her here in the program. She'll be the first speaker. And then a more familiar face out here, because this is his second tour of duty, second time he's been out here, is Dr. Hugo Lai. And Hugo has recently made a very significant decision that he is going to try to stay in and practice in Northwest Arkansas, hip hip hooray, uh, because he's not just from the next state over, he's from Nova Scotia. And uh, I think he, to leave such a beautiful place, I had two daughters growing up who, after reading Anne of Green Gables, they wanted to go that direction, you know, well, let's just move there. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's been a delight to have with us. and. And one of the, the young doctors we're so, so very proud of. So with that, I will hand it over to Ashlyn to get us started. And I will say for anybody that's viewing it on TV from home, we, we encourage questions, not just from the live audience, but by, by phone. And if you want to call in with questions, here's the number, 479-200-9259. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashlyn. Okay, this is working. Good. Well, hello. Like Dr. Wright said, I'm Ashlyn Abbott, and um, I'm going to start us out today. And thank you all for coming. Let's see if we can start here. Okay, so 
We're going to be talking about prevention and screenings, specifically in the older adult. And so just starting out, so prevention of disease should be one of your goals every time you go to the doctor. You know, if you're going for a sick visit, that's one thing. But somewhere in the back of your mind, you should be thinking about the prevention of disease and what things that you that could bring you in that you could be preventing and how we can do that. But it should also be unique to you and patient-centered. And so it's not a one-size-fits-all, you know, every single preventative um, diagnosis or preventative screen is not what we should do for everyone. We have to be unique in that. And so we're going to talk through some of those things about why you might do one screen in one person and why someone else might not need that screen. And so that's really kind of where we're starting at. And so just know that these are very unique. And when you go to some doctors, they may say, oh, well, you're this age. You may not need that screen. And we'll talk through some of those things today as well. So here, um, this is kind of the reasoning behind the prevention screening. So actually, there are very few older adults. And by older adults here, we mean people over 75 that have been included in randomized controlled trials. So if you know about medicine in general, everything that we do is by randomized controlled trials. That's why we put you on the medication we do. That's why we do the screenings we do. And so people in your category are not usually put in randomized controlled trials for whatever reason. Um, and so a lot of the preventative measures are not designed for people over 75. They just kind of leave you out to decide on your own. And so um, th this is, again, we're reiterating, it's important to consider the effect of preventative health, not only on the quantity of life, but quality of life. So if I tell you, oh, you need this scan for this preventative scan, then you have to think, OK, well, is there any harm to me if I get that? And if you find something, is it going to better my life or is it going to affect my life in any way? Okay, so we'll start off with cancer screenings. So cancer screenings are used to identify the cancers that we can treat or remove before they progress. And um, this would be to find the cancers that we know we can stop, the ones that we know we can identify early, the ones that um, would have less harm in the screening and um, that we could screen early, prevent early. And we'll talk about those specific ones. So first, for breast cancer, I can't see that little writing up there. So it is recommended that women get a mammogram every two years. And this is a new finding is that a clinical breast exam, which I think it talks about here, is not enough. And so that's something that's been in the last like 10 years that we've really realized is a clinical breast exam really doesn't tell us a whole lot. Um, just the difference in training and the difference in now the visits have to be smaller because insurances only pay so much for visits. And so really, in order to find breast cancer, you need to do a mammogram. But there, this, it is unknown whether screening a screening mammogram in uh, someone who's over 75 results in a survival benefit. And that's something that I think is, we talk about with Dr. Wright a lot, it's kind of ageist. And it's basically saying, well, we don't know if there's a benefit in someone who's over 75. But really, if a doctor tells you, oh, you're 75, you don't need to screen anymore, it's really because randomized controlled trials haven't included people over 75. And so I would encourage you, if you are an active person and you know if you found breast cancer and you're over 75 and you would treat it to continue to do those exams and to continue to get mammograms even though they may not be 
indicated by the books. Um, because really, people over 75 weren't included in those trials. And I think a note here is, this is why I think it's really important to be seen by a geriatrician once you are considered an older adult because geriatricians are more versed in the nuances of these screenings and the nuances of when, you know, the, um, the more holistic po population would stop. And so I think if you're seen by a geriatrician, they, they would know these things. Well, randomized control trials didn't include people over 75, so we would continue screening you, whereas a primary care doctor that sees babies and 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 50-year-olds says, oh, well, the screenings say stop at 75, so we'll just stop. And so I think that's, that's a really important note that um, geriatricians play in this role. Okay. And then we'll go on to colorectal cancer screening. And um, this is something I had to change on this PowerPoint. So it used to be that we started screening at 50. I bet that's when you all started screening for colon cancer. It recently changed to 45. So um, if someone asks you about that, you know the quiz answer is that it's 45 years old is when we start now. But it also says, 45 to 75, and it's again, because people over 75 were not included in randomized controlled trials. So you're supposed to get a colonoscopy every 10 years, unless they find polyps, and then your doctor would tell you five years or three years. And that's because it takes ten, about 10 years um, for, if you had no polyps, it would take 10 years for a polyp to grow and then turn into cancer. But then it takes three to five years for a polyp to turn cancerous. And so that's why it changes based on that. Or you could um, do the fecal occult blood test, which is just a blood test in the office um, with stool every five years if you um, were unable to do a colonoscopy and do all the prep and all of that. And then um, this last sentence, the screening in adults 76 to 85 should be, uh, like what we were talking about, should be unique. It should be centered around you. You know, if you have colon cancer in your family, if you're very anxious about it, if you are having symptoms, I think that's something that we should talk about, and then you should go and have a screen. And so if you're having any anxiety about it at all, I would say it's worth getting a screen, even if we do one in the office. And um, go on to this one. And this one um, just is talking about that there is an increased prevalence of colorectal cancer with age. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have colorectal cancer. But uh, there also are harms with colonoscopy. If any of you have had a colonoscopy, you know it's not the most enjoyable thing in the world to go through. But it tells us a lot about your health. And this is just a little plug that I wanted to make. Um, I'm not sponsored by Cola Garden anyway. But just did want to say that we have prescribed some of these this month, um, some Cola Guards. And you've probably seen the commercials with this little box guy. And he just says, you just go and then you ship it off. Or I don't know what their little catchy phrase is. But um, so Cologuard is an at-home fecal blood test or fecal DNA test. And so you go on the slide and then you send it off. And it's every three years. And recently, Medicare just approved it that they will pay for Cologuard every three years. And we've had good luck this month. We've prescribed some, and so I think that they're getting paid for and getting patients screened. So if you're you are anxious about going through the colonoscopy or that just doesn't sound like something you would want to do, this is a good option. And what it does is it takes your stool and runs it through a DNA scan, and cancers and precancers give off DNA. Uh, in your stool, and this will screen for that, and it can actually tell you if it's precancer or cancer in your stool. And then you would have to go get a colonoscopy to figure out the staging and different things like that. But um, it is a good tool, it's easy, and it, you can do it at home. Okay, now moving on to cervical cancer. So you 
are recommended to stop cervical cancer screening at 65 if you've never had an abnormal screen or if you've had two normal screens back to back and then you turn 65. So um, this is regardless of new sexual partners, any um, sexual history, at 65 it's you're good to go and then also um, if you've had two negative HPV results in 10 years and making sure that the last one was in the last five years. But Medicare will cover pap smears um, every two years until you're 65. And um, and this is just a, a summary of why that is, that after middle age, cervical cancer drastically declines. And I'm very anxious to see what this slide will look like in 20 years, now that we have an HPV vaccine, now that everyone who is um, between, I think it's down to age seven, seven or nine now, you can get the, vaccine, the HPV vaccine. Um, and so hopefully this will be a cancer that will be 100% preventable in at least hopefully my lifetime. We will never see cervical cancer again if we can get enough people to take the vaccine. So, um, and then just of note, someone who has a total hysterectomy without a cervix, you do not have to have a pap smear because there's nothing to get cells from. Okay, so one that is uh, kind of a hot topic is a prostate cancer screen. So men specifically, this is one where you really have to think about the benefits versus the risk. So 80% of high PSAs, it's a blood test, that's what we use to check for prostate cancer, 80% of high numbers are false positives. So that means your PSA is high for whatever reason. Um, BPH, age, there are a lot of things that can make your PSA high without having prostate cancer. It is recommended um, a yearly PSA if you have a value over 2.5 initially. And then usually a digital rectal exam as well. And that is really... Um, where you can find out more, you know. If you have a high PSA, but then your digital rectal exam is negative, that is showing that really it's probably a false positive. But, you know, you have to think about the next step is a prostate biopsy. So if you have a high PSA, your digital rectal exam, they, you know, they tell you everything is probably okay, but would recommend a prostate exam, that's kind of a big deal and can have some big repercussions. Um, there are complications with prostate biopsies. And so um, I would encourage you, if it's something that runs in your family, if your doctor has recommended, you know, if you had a high PSA at a younger age, um, and also if it's, if it's inclining at a normal rate, that that's all very normal. Um, but to really think about, you know, if you, um, a lot of people just come in and they say, oh, I need my PSA checked. They think it's just a routine thing. But really, a false positive result can make you worry. It can make you think, oh, something's really wrong, when in reality, there are a lot of false positives. Okay, and the next one is lung cancer. So this one um, is for anyone who has a 30-pack year smoking history and is over 55 and either currently smoke or have quit in the pa past 15 years, um, you should have a lung cancer screening. And that is a low dose CT scan. So do you just go through the CT scanner? Um, and screening should stop when the patient has not smoked for 15 years. So if you quit smoking 14 years ago, smoked for 30 years, then you can go back and you, you just have one and you're done. But if you are still a current smoker, you need these every year. And these are just to monitor nodules. Um, the CT scan would find any nodules early. And th this is how to calculate your PAC 
smoking years. So, um, like I said, if it, if you're over 30 pack years, then you need a low dose CT scan. But, um, so if you smoked half a pack for 20 years, then you would just have a, a 10 pack year history. You would not need a low dose CT scan, but if you smoked two packs a day for 20 years, then you would be at 40 and you would need one. Okay. So now going, moving on from cancer to other um, disease states. So hypertension screens. So everyone needs a hypertension screen. You definitely get this. If you go to the doctor, you get your blood pressure taken while you're in the office. And that um, is our hypertension screen. But also, if it's high in the office, you also need to take it at home. And if you come to our office here at UAMS, you'll hear us say that a lot. It's high today. Go home and check it when you're in your own surroundings. Check it when you're not at the doctor's office. Um, check it, you know, when you're in your normal settings under normal circumstances because there is some form of going to the doctor's office raising it. And before we start people on any medication, we will have you check it at home a few times and then come back. And then sometimes we even have you sit in the office for five minutes, calm down, and then take it again. So that is a hypertension screening. And you should do that once a year as well. Okay, and then diabetes screening. So... Every adult in the U.S. Um, over 45 years old, it is recommended that they get treat, um, tested for uh, screen for diabetes once a year, once every one to three years. Usually if you go to your doctor, they're going to do this once a year. Uh, it's a hemoglobin A1C. It's a blood test. And um, that will be once a year on your routine um, blood draws. And then... It, the recommendation is to start at 40 years old in someone who is obese. Okay, so this one is just for the guys again. So um, screening for triple A's or abdominal aortic aneurysms. So a one-time screening of men over 65 who have ever smoked. So someone who has ever smoked more than 100 cigarettes in their life they need a AAA screen. And this is an ultrasound. It's just an abdominal ultrasound like uh, Maya will do for all of her pregnant ladies. It's super non-invasive. And um, just do that one time to check. And then if they find something, then it would be monitored every six months or every year. Okay, so osteoporosis screenings, and I talk about, I've talked about this a few times today with my patients. This is something that is a hot topic here because we want to prevent falls and we want to prevent breaks and we want to prevent osteoporosis. It's um, something that I think you all should have on the front of your minds and thinking about. And we do a routine screen with an x-ray. It's called a DEXA scan, D-E-X-A. And Medicare pays for that every two years in women over 65 and men over 80. And really the reason why we do this is so it will put you in a category of nothing, you're great, osteoporosis or osteopenia. And so we can um, tweak our uh, what we can do for you based on that. There are some new medications that have come out to treat osteoporosis and then also osteopenia and that would be if you fall into that category you would be on uh, vitamin D and calcium um, for that and we can also you know we can't prevent it from c coming back you know it, the numbers usually don't get a whole lot better but we can prevent it from getting worse and really that's what we're trying to do is prevent the osteopenia from going to osteoporosis and catch it early and so uh, I highly recommend DEXA scans every two years to prevent um, osteopenia from going to osteoporosis. And that was an x-ray. The DEXA scan is an x-ray. I didn't say that. And um, 
so I said men over 80, but also the National Osteoporosis Foundation says men over 70. So I don't know if, uh, if you could make a case for Medicare if they would pay for someone uh, between 70 and 80, but we could probably figure out a way to do a prior authorization for that. That would be a Dr. Wright and Robin question. <laughs> Okay, and then screening for hyperlipidemia. Um, so a lot of the guidelines say to use statins for cardiovascular disease. So if you've ever had a stroke, a heart attack, any kind of embolism, you're probably on a statin um, because we treat it for cardiovascular disease rather than an LDL target. But someone who has a really high LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, um, that we would use a very high dose statin in someone who had an LDL over 190. Normal, we would like to keep you under 100. And um, statins have been associated with modest reduction of cardiovascular disease. And one note, a new trial that came out in 2020, statins also we, they kind of get a bad rap because of some of their side effects. They can cause muscle aches and different things like that. But really, the trial in 2020 found that statins, if you have a plaque, so in order to have a stroke or a heart attack or a pulmonary embolism, you grow a plaque of lipids, and then it breaks off, and that's what causes the embolism. So statins, they have found, also have a factor where they can kind of stabilize those plaques and just adhere to the wall and so they don't break off and cause heart attacks and strokes. And so that's a really um, something that I think will kind of change how we use statins um, and we have a lot of patients on statins and I think it'll just increase that we keep you on them for longer because we know that they're really good drugs at stabilizing those plaques. Okay, and then um, hepatitis C and B screenings. So if you were born between 1945 and 1965, it is recommended that you have a one-time hepatitis C screen, and that is a blood test. And you may say, there's no way I have hepatitis. I, you know, have never used IV drugs. I don't have any high-risk behaviors. But the reason why we screen people in between 45 and 65 born between 1945 and 1965 is because 75% of people in the U.S. right now that have hepatitis C were born between those years because blood transfusions were not screened for hepatitis C when um, those blood, during those years before 1992, they did not screen um, blood transfusions for hepatitis C. So a lot of people are walking around with hepatitis C and don't even know it. So it's just a one-time blood test and screening and then we can prevent it from going on any further. Thanks. And now Dr. Lai will take over. Hello everyone, Dr. Lai. So Dr. Abbott gave a very long talk about, you know, very important issues, cancer screenings and things like that. My section is more about um, vaccinations and things like physical activity, nutrition, um, alcohol misuse, and smoking cessation. So uh, these are you know, typical things we talk about in the office. We ask whether you drink, smoke, how much activity you get. Uh, so if the first thing is talking about how much physical activity uh, we all should be getting. So for adults, uh, there's this magic number of 150 minutes uh, per week of uh, exercise. So there's a lot of data on that, uh, why this specific number. Uh, you get the most bang for your buck at this 150 minute uh, per week exercise. Um, there's really only very few things that you can do for as far as uh, lifestyle modifications that really drop your mortality rate and exercise. If you do up to 150 minutes per week, um, your mortality goes down by almost 33% compared to someone who isn't active. So th th this is a very important slide. Um, now, uh, you wanna combine that with strength training uh, twice a week, w which is, and how do you define that? 
um, you can use free weights, dumbbells. So the recommendation is um, you want to train each muscle group uh, between 12 to 15 repetitions. So, it, for example, if you want to focus on your biceps, do uh, 12 to 15 cur uh, repetitions, and that should tire out that muscle group, and you only have to do that one, one set. Um, and now, if you have balance issues, it's recommended that um, you also perform things like Tai Chi or dance and to increase that, uh, to help with balance. Uh, now, nutrition, I won't get too much into this, but uh, in the office we look a lot on BMI, body mass index. That's one way we kind of take a look at your, your weight. It's, it's calculated based on your weight and height. Um, and the USPSTF, which is a group of experts, United States Preventative Services Task Force, they recommend that obese adults, so BMI over 30 is considered obese, uh, get interventions. But older adults, really the sweet spot is between 25 and 29 BMI. That's considered overweight, but that's actually okay in that age group. It has actually has a lower mortality. So if you have uh, any extremes of weight, if you're uh, more underweight or more overweight, that's where the mortality kind of increases. And then screening for, for alcohol misuse. Um, so how do we define that? Um, so light to moderate alcohol use is defined as one drink uh, per day for, for older adults over 65. Um, so we always have to ask, like, how, what's one drink? That's like 12 ounces of beer or five ounces of wine. Um, now, yeah, we ask that at least annually. Uh, now, smoking screening, uh, we have to talk about that because, you know, smoking cessation really reduces the rate of COPD, heart disease, and certain cancers. Um, these numbers here are pulled from a two, like a 2002-year study. So if you stop, if someone stops smoking at age 35, you 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 can increase your life expectancy by about eight and a half years. Uh, and even if you someone who's smoked up to age 65 and then they quit, they can inc still increase their lifespan by about on average two years. So it's still important, no matter what age, to kind of think about s stopping smoking because it still has that long-term effect. And, and for women, it's it's similar. Um, if you stop at 35, quit smoking, you ex your lifespan on average 7.7 uh, .7 years. And if you quit at 65, it's a little bit better, uh, increase of 3.7 years. And I just grabbed this table off of the CDC website because sometimes uh, People who are smokers are a little resistant to quit uh, based on their age. Oh, I've been smoking for 30 years. I'm not going to quit now. It's not worth it. But just looking at this table, uh, you, you can see some benefits even within the first year. Uh, you know, within the first few minutes, your heart rate start, starts to drop. Um, within the first day, your nicotine level kind of clears out in, in your blood. Um, after, after a few days, your carbon monoxide level kind of drops back to normal range. And then... The longer term effects, if you quit for a year, your symptoms decrease, shortness of breath uh, and cough. Uh, one to two years after s after quitting, you know, your risk of heart disease, heart attacks kind of kind of goes down. And there's longer term effects too at the five to 20 year mark where your risk of cancer kind of drops uh, as well. Uh, and this is just kind of talking about other um, things we kind of screen, especially at those wellness visits. Uh, and I'll go through each one. So falls, uh, we always ask about falls because uh, um, it's so important to, you know, prevent that. Uh, um, if we see someone who have balance issues, we, you know, we get alerted uh, for that. You know, it, if, if you if people fall and break a hip, that really sets sets people back. Uh, people who break a hip, I mean, y y I think the data is still like 30% of those people. There's a 30% mortality at a, at the one year uh, mark, w and that's with surgery. So, um, 
uh, incontinence, we always have to ask about this as well, uh, something that doesn't usually come up sometimes in just routine visits. So we tend to ask this question. That's why we ask it, uh, especially for, for women who have, have had multiple children, diabetics, uh, and older adults. Now, cognitive status, uh, the USPSTF, they don't have enough evidence to recommend routine screening, but at your wellness visits, uh, we do uh, perform cognitive testing. Uh, so a lot of you may be familiar with the mini cog where we ask you to draw a clock and remember certain items. Um, so that's, that's for cognition. Uh, depression, we, that's also part of re routine screening, uh, at least annually. Uh, same thing with the annual wellness exams, we kind of screen for that. Uh, the one we use in the office is the uh, patient health questionnaire, number two, where we ask two questions. You know, over the past two weeks, have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless? Then the second question is, over the past two weeks, have you felt little interest or pleasure in doing things? And if you answer yes to either of those, we kind of uh, dive deeper with additional questions. Um, so vision, again, uh, USPSTF, um, there's not really enough evidence to, um, like, say that you should be routinely screening for vision, but we do that at the annual wellness visit as well. Um, and if there's any issues there, we usually refer to like an ophthalmologist. Uh, same thing with um, hearing. Uh, there's really not that much evidence for routine screening, but uh, we do do those uh, at the yearly uh, visits. And uh, this slide is, the first few things are more safety and prevention. Um, first few are kind of common sense things, you know, checking smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, not setting your water heater um, uh, too hot, um, wearing your seat belts, and taking precautions against heat strokes. So, you know, hydrate, hydrate well if it's a hot day. Um, undergoing regular driving tests, that's, that's on there as well. Uh, a lot of older adults are still driving, but they make up for a lot of the um, accidents that happen. And also the um, advanced directives and healthcare proxies, which a lot of you already have. Uh, this part's about vaccinations, uh, very you know, important for preventative medicine. Uh, so routinely, flu vaccines every year, uh, a lot of data that um, adults who who get the flu vaccine annually just just do better. Um, this tetanus and diphtheria booster, that's every 10 years, that prevents uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and, per and uh, pertussis, that causes whooping cough. Um, herpes zoster vaccine, so that's, that, that's the shingles vaccine. So uh, shingles is kind of a reactivation of uh, the zoster virus. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, a third of adults will have it in their lifetime. And so that's very important to uh, get this vaccine. Now the Zostavax is the older version. Uh, that's a one-time dose recommended for people who are over 60. And now there's a newer uh, vaccine, the Shingrex. It's a two-part vaccine. Um, so, the fr so you get the first dose and then two to six months afterwards you get the second dose. And that's effective at preventing 90% of cases. Uh, pneumonia vaccine, um, that's very important. So anyone over 65 should be getting their pneumonia vaccinations. Um, it's usually a two-part series. You get the 13 uh, first, and then you get the 23 in, um, in a year. So uh, the 13 and 23 just denotes um, which type of pneumococcus it's covering. And then some other medications for kind of prevent pre prevention. And um, uh, there's a lot of talk about aspirin. It used to be where uh, people take aspirin to prevent uh, cardiovascular disease. And now it's a little uh, more blurry where, you know, it's not recommended for primary prevention. And especially you have to individualize for people who are uh, older and, and who are at risk of bleeding. Uh, 
uh, vitamin D supplementation and calcium supplementation. Um, so the general consensus, the, the American Geriatric Society recommends 1,000 units of vitamin D a day. Um, other societies, you know, 2,000 units is also safe. Uh, some people take up to 5,000. That's fine too. So um, calcium supplementation is really between 500 and 1,200 milligrams, and that's to uh, reduce risk of fractures. Um, uh, multivitamins, there's really not enough evidence to recommend that according to the USPSTF. And uh, postmenopausal therapy, so estrogen therapy, um, not really recommended for primary prevention, but obviously if you, if you have symptoms, hot flashes, things like that, that's kind of a different story. So this slide's about the framework for discussing when to stop screening. I think Dr. Abbott touched on that a little bit, and we just have to kind of individualize um, and, and kind of talk about when to uh, stop these screenings, especially the cancer screenings. And then these are some recommendations from uh, Choosing Wisely, another uh, or, or organization that makes recommendations. Um, some of them are, you know, we don't use PET or CT scans to screen for cancer. That's not, it's not cost effective and it, it doesn't really catch um, uh, more, more cancers that way. Well, And then Dr. Abbott talked about all the screenings for breast and colon cancer. Um, PSA is controversial and has to be uh, kind of individualized. And things like, you know, colon cancer, I think we talked about that already every, every 10 years, and it shouldn't be repeated if, 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 if it was a completely normal colonoscopy. Um, and then we don't r routinely uh, perform cancer screenings on dialysis patients based on um, their life expectancy. So, so I think the takeaway points are really, um, in summary, um, you really have to individualize um, each patient. And there's different recommendations from different organizations, and you kind of have to take uh, the consensus and and kind of go from there and, and re really talk about what your goals are and and the risk and benefits of each uh, screening test uh, so I think that's all we have this is just some references so I think we'll take some questions at this time I think Dr. Wright will come by with great um, well, that's an overview, and it, it, it was enough of an overview to realize it's kind of complicated, too. And it is a lot, a lot of uh, what makes it a little difficult uh, sometimes to answer individual questions as it varies from person to person in their situation. But, but overall, these are great guidelines, and we didn't, the first half of my career, we didn't have such, such good guidelines for every disease. Uh, and it, it, I think it is really helpful to get it standardized and be able to say that you know what it does reflect that's so useful is this is a represent these recommendations rec represent a consensus of the experts in the fields that apply and that that makes a big difference to me now I'll just have to share a bias with you I think some of this no longer have to worry about uh, screening not recommended after a certain age I think that's individualized too. In fact, there's a little bit of ageism going on there as far as I'm concerned. I mean, uh, you know, I've got a lot of 80-year-olds in this building who I predict will live to be 100 and be pretty healthy doing it most of those years, and that hardly justifies uh, quitting screening for things, my goodness. Uh, and some of these things too, uh, I mean, take mammograms. Um, I still think it's worthy at, at any age to find a breast cancer at a point that it's a, it's a lumpectomy and often cured versus waiting to find out where the metastases go and what your, your end of life course is going to be with that. So I have a, I have a bias here, I admit, and, and reasonable people can disagree about 
some of this, but I, I sense a little, you know, 10 years? Yeah. They're, it's like they've never seen an 85-year-old with greater than a 10-year life expectancy. I think they have a sheltered existence. <laughs> but anyway, are there questions? Yes. There were two questions in the first half of the presentation that were for men only. One had to do with the aortic valve, and the other was osteo osteoporosis. Why for men only? Do women not have aortic valve problems or osteoporosis? Um, so the abdominal aortic aneurysm, the AAA, more men have them so much so that Screening is only for men. It's so rare for a woman to have one. And it's only for men who have smoked. So, yeah, so we, don't, we just get to skip out on that one. And then the osteoporosis one, we have different recommendations. So women are still get DEXA screenings, but at different ages, we get osteoporosis sooner than men. So we have to start at 65, whereas they get to start at 70 or 80 based on recommendations. So, yeah. They just, they get a couple more things and we get a couple more things. That's just how it works. <laughs> the last thing you mentioned was not to take multivitamins. I just bought a new bottle. Should I give it away? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll answer that one. Um, so, um, so it says there's not enough sufficient evidence to to take it, but I don't think there's any harm t in, in doing so. Yeah. So you have to take a look at the risk benefit. There's just not enough data for it, meaning they, they may not may not have looked at it uh, so closely. Any risk to taking it? I I, I don't really see any any risk. Yeah, unless you're taking like you know, five or ten multivitamins a day, then that can be a problem. But if you're taking it as recommended, like once daily, that, that doesn't cause any issues. Yeah, I think he answered that exactly right. I think he answered that just the way I would. That I, I think there are a lot of vitamins that you can take too much of. But in a typical multiple vitamin preparation, you're taking one a day, um, you're not going to run the risk of that. But I, I find some people finding recommendations somewhere that says a specific vitamin, specific B vitamin, take big doses of this, those kind of things. That can run into a problem. But in a standard multivitamin preparation, that's never going to be too much. How much good they do? Uh, there's not enough evidence to prove it, uh, but it may be something we know 10 years from now uh, are, are very worthwhile, but it's, it's just not been established completely. So, uh, so the right question, I think, is if you have an interest at all in taking multiple vitamin, um, is does it bother you? If it doesn't bother you, you know, if it doesn't, some people have, sensitive stomachs and some of these vitamins can be hard on the stomach. Uh, most people get away with it fine, but it, as long as it didn't bother you, uh, it's probably safe in that preparation. And who knows how much it helps. It may help a lot more than we know. So obviously there are a lot of people who believe strongly in them, but I think the evidence in most cases isn't strong enough to, to really promote it exactly. Anything to offer? Yes, Dr. Helen. <laughs> well, my question doesn't really apply so much to our age group, but it's a question I sure would like to ask you, and that's this. From what I'm reading, uh, there are going to be more and more uh, medicine based on the uh, genome of the individual. Uh, so that they talk about personalized medicine. And the object of this, of course, is to, is to do a genetic 
uh, sequence mapping uh, so as to be able to tell a person what diseases they might develop and therefore be careful about. There are pros and cons to this, as I'm sure you, you know, and I'd like to have you speak to this, but the, the pros would be that if a person knows that they might develop a particular disease, they could change lifestyle so perhaps to avoid that disease. The con is though that if they discover something like Huntington's or other diseases for which there's very little cure you can do about it, it would make that person miserable for the rest of their lives. What do you know about that and what do you think about it? I'll just I'll speak to my personal experience. So my dad had lupus, systemic lupus. And so for a long time, there's never been a good test for that. There's an ANA, which is a generalized blood test that you can do for any rheumatological. And there's a lot of false positives. And so I had to think about, do I want to continue to do those blood tests every year? And then that blood test come back positive, And all of a sudden, I go to a rheumatologist for the rest of my life. And then there's a new uh, genomic sequencing that came out. It's about $10,000. But you can get it done, and it will tell you what your risk of developing lupus is in your lifetime. So my rheumatologist talked to me about it. And I would say, A, uh, I don't I care, but not $10,000 worth um, to, <laughs> to find out that way. But also, I think that that's going to be one of the big issues is these tests are so expensive that the people who can afford them, you know, then they could also afford the, the medications to treat things that are very expensive and individualized. But the medications are also going to be, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to individualize medication. And so I think that's a, that's a big obstacle that we're going to have to overcome is making these more affordable. Actually, that's going to get a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, the technology is developing in so quickly now yeah. uh, in such a way that, that it won't be an unusual thing mm -hmm. if a person wishes to, to have their total genetic uh, cons constituency tested, mm -hmm. they can do it. Now, you two are going into the practice of medicine and will really be dealing with this in the future. Mm -hmm. What will be your basis for advising a patient to uh, take that genetic test or not? How would you decide that per patient? So I have only done this for one patient so far. So for psychiatric medications, specifically SSRIs for depression and anxiety, there is a, an affordable test right now. The name of it has left me. But it does a genomic sequencing on which um, SSRI is m most compatible with your genetic sequence. So I have ordered those for patients because individualizing that, those medications is very hard. Finding one that can help a patient is very hard. And it takes six weeks, and then you, you, know, you go back and forth. So I think if you have a, a patient that a normal medication is not helping them, a normal medication, or they're, still, they're having uh, side effects to a normal medication, a, a routine medication, or you just can't figure out exactly what's going on. You know, most of the time, hypertension, we can fix that. We put them on a normal medication. But I think someone who um, kind of has a zebra um, disease or rheumatology, I think, is some a place that they will use those a lot because rheumatological diseases just have a lot of different presentations, and it's hard to get a diagnosis a lot of the times. When you're talking about the types of tests that you do today, mm -hmm. <coughs> screening tests particularly, and particularly for cancer, uh, a lot of times it can come out, not a lot of times, maybe, but it can come out to mean that you do have cancer and you need then to have a, a very invasive and dangerous kind of surgery. Now, what, what can people our age expect these days of surgery 
but it's invasive and serious in our age group. And therefore, uh, what the, would these screen, screening tests do for us? trying to understand the question correctly. I think we still have to kind of individualize and not order the test. So we have to premise the test with, if this is positive, are you willing to undergo an invasive procedure? You know, this is, th these could be the options. So if, if we're not willing to undergo uh, an invasive procedure, that test, screening test may not be uh, the best option for you, uh, if that makes sense. Or if you just want to know, then that's fine. But you also want to know what the next steps. Um, so that's kind of depends on which s type of screening test you're talking about. Is there anything specific that you? Uh, breast cancer. So we're talking about mammograms there. Um, so, you know, it depends on what stage we catch it at. If, if, if say, say we do a mammogram, a, a woman's never had it, and, you know, they find a lump, then that can be taken care of, non, you know, very small procedure. But if we're talking, it's already spread, it's, it's a larger tumor, it's not that easy to access, then you're talking about a more invasive surgery, mastectomy, chemo radiation, things like that. Um, so it kind of depends on when when you catch it, but those are some of the possibilities. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, the screen test shows that we need surgery. What can we expect in the way of our surgical outcome? I know it's individual, but in general, I'm trying to ask then how dangerous is surgery that is invasive and dangerous for people in our age group. I, I see. So, I mean, age, y you do have an increased risk based on age, but you're really looking at other conditions that an individual may have. So, you know, if you have heart disease, lung disease, kidney, liver issues, then that all increases your surgical risk. And there's surgical risk calculators out there that you can plug in all these factors and gives you uh, a percentage that you that a patient won't do well or will do well, and uh, and usually surgeons kind of tailor to that. Uh, I know it's not the best answer. We're kind of more internal medicine physicians, but but there are calculators out there to to gauge that risk. Um. Yeah, it's hard to get very specific, you know, and and then generalize from it. Um, and I and I do think. You know, as, as a broad statement, it's fair to say that it's um, the the rigors of invasive surgery often are harder. You know, the older you are, certainly every decade, you're, you take it harder. The recovery is longer and more difficult uh, often. Um, and and I and I kind of see surgeons going both ways. Um, often saying, well, I know she's 85, but I think she can tolerate the surgery. And often it's the recovery that, the full recovery that's the bigger thing than even the surgery. Um, but, but uh, I, you know, <laughs> one of the things I'm, I try to be careful about and try to remind myself of, there's a risk both ways. In, in taking care of primarily an older adult patient population. I think there's a risk to, to have a bias that causes you to undertreat things. You know, what do you expect you're 88 years old? You know, that, that knee is 88 years old, what do you expect? That's the patient who then said, well, my other knee is 88 years old too and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> but then, um, so, so there's kind of a bias sometimes to undertreat, but there's also an increasing bias that I'm just as scared of, and that is over-treating. Because uh, one, one, one thing every last one of us uh, experiences with age 
and yes, some of us earlier than others, but, but we're all experiencing it, is an increasing vulnerability to all sorts of stresses, uh, including the stresses of overcoming, you know, recovering from surgery, this kind of thing. Uh, and so it, it's the question you're asking, even though we don't seem to have exactly the answer, uh, and, and it, it, it varies from person to person as you counsel them, is, um, you know, what's, um, what is the risk benefit for this individual? You know, the, the risk is always going to be being susceptible to, to the stressors that are going to be involved in this whole thing. My brother just had a, you know, this is a success story to right now. He's, he is uh, now 76, going to be 77. Um, was having some GI symptoms and pain and went to his internist who said, well, it's been going on for a month or two. I, you know, I, listen, I think we need to do a CAT scan. Did a CAT scan and he had a five centimeter mass in the head of his pancreas, which the radiologist pronounced right there in the in the report, almost certainly pancreatic cancer. Well, I, I bet everybody in this room knows what that prognosis is. They used to say in medical school, untreated at six months, treated, it's a half a year. It kind of doesn't matter. Uh, there's poor prognosis. Uh, but in medical school, we're also taught to look for a certain other benign tumor in these cases called a carcinoid tumor. And I've looked in hundreds of patients for carcinoids and never find them. I've only seen a few that I've gotten to take care of over the years. He had a carcinoid tumor. My goodness, that's the good news. The bad news is uh, MD Anderson felt like he still needed the really extensive surgery. Have any of you ever heard of a Whipple procedure? The most extensive abdominal surgery there is. It's a 10 hour surgery. So he went through that and today, <laughs> He, I was on the phone with him, th that was six days ago. He said, I'm ready for them to check me back in the hospital if it's gonna keep hurting this much, you know. And I didn't dream it was gonna be this hard getting over this. Uh, uh, so, you know, it, it, it varies a, a lot. Now, fortunately, he's in good health prior to this, but it wouldn't take but one or two other diagnoses to have made, made him at very high risk for, now he's gonna recover, I'm sure of that, but. He's going to deal with some pain along the way, but this is kind of what we're all dealing with. I don't think I answered a thing you said, Helen, but uh, I rambled on. Um, anything you want to to add? You know, the the uh, such an interesting topic, the pharmacogenomic profiling, and. Um, especially the psychotropic medications. Uh, and I, I, some of the reading I've done recently made me feel that, you know, we probably ought to be testing more, more people who were considering these medications. And I mentioned this to our dean, who's a psychiatrist, and she polled immediately on an email that day seven colleagues around the country uh, at Menninger's, at Mayo, at, you know, other centers. And they all said, well, we do it some in selected patients, but, um, but really, in most cases, a really good history and physical and examination, you know, would, would, get, would, would cause us to get it right more often than those. We're, we're, we're wary of these tests that aren't yet Predict aren't yet reliable in what they suggest. Uh, I think that is the future, though. I think it's coming. They're going to get this refined in a way that uh, well, one of those one of those psychiatrists, academic psychiatrists, said, "You know, we do some because we're kind of advertised as, you know, doing everything, and so yeah, we it's among the extra things we do because they've had so many things done by the time they're referred to us." But he said. I still don't really believe in it. I think it's it's going to be misleading sometimes. So. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, it is. 
I think it is, I think in the future, all this testing is going to be, give us so much more wisdom about select, how s selected we are and who goes through what, but uh, it, it's got a ways to go still. <laughs> so researchers like you are going to help define it. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? Thank you for your attention. Yes. Good. Uh, decades ago, I read that uh, fever has the power to kill cancer, in, um, and this was observed in the 1800s that a person with a cancerous tumor, uh, if he got pneumonia independently, and had ran a high fever and almost died, but he didn't die, that often uh, the tumor was greatly reduced or even disappeared. So I wonder if you could uh, comment on what the up-to-date information is on the, the power of fever to control somewhat uh, some cancers. I think it's a fascinating question that I, I have no good information to confirm that. I, it's not something I've seen. It doesn't surprise me that there's some anecdotal stuff out there, but I I would doubt that it's very, very common. But have you all, are you all aware of any of that literature? If it is, we'll start hearing more about it <laughs> probably in, in the coming months. So that's interesting, exciting. It's in the old literature, and there's some cases where a cancer patient was actually given typhoid fever in order to try to part of, part of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and to say that I remember something, s or I don't remember apparently, something similar that I've <laughs> run across that I can't remember enough to comment intelligently, but that sounds familiar. Anything else? Maya, any comments? You've, you've supported us quietly and patiently. Well, sir. I had uh, looked it up while you all were talking about the fever killing the cancer cells because I have never heard of that. And apparently, um, yes, hyperthermia can uh, kill cancer cells, but it has to be regulated because obviously uh, heat can also damage normal tissue cells as well. So interesting theory or interesting treatment that I hadn't heard of. So I learned something. Well, I learned a lot of things, but <laughs> that in particular. <laughs> I, I hope some of you have met Dr. Swindell, our extra physician who fills in out here when I can't be here. Uh, I look forward to the Butterfield Trail community getting to know him. Uh, he's a fabulous, fabulous guy. I think I'll bring him to one of these just to introduce him and give people a chance to, uh, to see him. Um, he's so much better than me. I hate to say that too loud, but that's... Um, thank you all. Thanks for coming. And uh, uh, the boosters are coming sometime. We just don't know yet, right? Uh, it w it's awaiting the, uh, the approval of the Moderna. It's been officially approved. That's breaking news. All right. Well, just know that Carl Collier is sitting on go, ready. <laughs> He's got it teed up to come out here. Uh, a few weeks ago, he said, well, I'm sure we're going to be out there by the end of October for anybody that wants it. I said, anybody that wants it, <laughs> you open that door and it's going to be a flood. And, and I'm, I'm still so proud of Butterfield for taking the vac vaccinations. It's such a high rate. That's just truly really marvelous. Marvelous. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.